Well, welcome back. My name is Jack Burgess. This is the second episode of a two-parter. In the first episode, we looked at structures on the first deck of my layout, and this time we're going to look at structures on the second deck. This is where we move from the first deck to the second deck across this bridge. I've been talking about buildings and structures and several of them that I've built more than once because I had more information, for example. This is actually the second bridge that was here, but it was not because I had more information. I had all the information I needed when I did the first one, but back in um, the 90s, I had an open house. There was a person that came in, maybe he was starstruck, I don't know, but he wasn't watching what he was doing, and he missed the step here and fell forward and hit the bridge that used to be there, which is this bridge. Um, this took about six months to build. It was all scratch built, all styrene, has all of the lacing. And in fact, when I was working on it, uh, I was working on it as a contest model, which I did a lot of in those days because it would actually push me to get things done. And I would be sitting in the house watching TV or something and my wife would say, shouldn't you be out in the shop working on that bridge? The contest is one month away. So I, I got it finished actually took an entire bottle of Floquil to paint it and uh, had it in place for many, many, many years. And um, then it ended up on the floor when he tripped. So there was no way I was going to build another one of these. I don't like doing, well, I shouldn't say, I don't like doing things a second time, but in the first episode, you've heard of many structures that I did more than once, one time, three times. But this was also a prototype bridge further up on the line. And that's got to be it. That's it. I'm not going to build another one of these. Okay, this is the Bagby Bridge uh, crossing the Merced River. The prototype was pretty neat. It was a 225 foot long Pratt truss bridge with plate girder approaches and a trestle. And the trestle's on a curve. Same over here. Uh, that shows up in the prototype photo. Now, one problem I had was fitting this in into the space I had because I didn't want to encroach further into Merced so I was really squeezed and so this should be a four panel bridge I cut it to two panels to shorten it up and then to keep the proportions correct I had to squeeze it down on the top and it looks pretty silly so that is one not that I didn't have the information I just I really wanted to include all these elements so what I'm planning on doing is taking this one out taking that pier out and making a longer bridge. One problem I've got with this bridge and my other steel bridge is getting there and cleaning the track. So I have not figured out a good way to have this come off so I can clean the track. Um, once I figure that out, I'll, I'll build a new one. This is completely all styrene. Not sure I'm gonna do that again. Uh, I might do photo etch brass and then I could build something that comes off and without being possibly broken. Uh, these are rods. What I would use next time is that uh, real fine, stretchy wire, or not wire, rope or something, so that you can actually put your finger in there and you wouldn't break something. Okay, this is the hotel at Bagby. I think I've talked about it in another video. This is one that my first effort was really bad. And here's a photo of that first effort. I didn't have enough prototype information as I keep mentioning, but I also didn't have the skill sets that I have now. And I also didn't have the, the general knowledge that most buildings at this time period were white. And if you kind of look around, you'll see very few buildings that are not white. And about, oh, maybe a year or two ago, I was out here and I was looking at it and I realized that is so ugly and so far from the prototype that I wanted to replace it. So this was one of the first models, buildings that I built with a lot of 3D printing. And I've told people that when I give clinics on 3D printing, it's very addictive. Um, I enjoy the drafting that you do, the drawing on the computer, getting things to work and uh, getting the parts and say, wow, that is so cool. So this building, there were no windows available that matched the prototype. I knew the size of the building, so I was able to draw plans for it. 
I wondered about this portion of it, and the river is right here. Uh, this is about two miles separating these two. So this is overlooking the river. I couldn't figure out what this was, and I kept, I, I said, I'm going to build it anyway, but it'd be nice to figure it out. And because of this small, this, this long smokestack, this has to be the kitchen for the hotel, because this building was built in 1900 and was to have a place for people to stay that were traveling between two towns on the mother load because they could not travel at night in a stagecoach. So they would stop. So you would have to be able to feed them breakfast and dinner. And so that's what this is. So I figured that out. Another one I couldn't figure out, it shows up in the photos, is this structure right here. Take a guess. It's the outhouse. And when I first thought about that, I thought, oh my goodness, what's going on? Uh, but it was actually a, a two-person outhouse, there's a men's and a women's side. And instead of a normal outhouse that has a hole in the ground that when it gets full, you just pull the, the outhouse and move it to somewhere else, fill in the hole. This one had buckets under there. And you can go online today, there are people that live off the grid and they will tell you how to manage an outhouse like this and they use ashes from the fireplace and there would be a bucket in the outhouse you would take some of those after you've used it and cover it up and that cuts all the smell so you learn a lot of stuff I didn't need to know that to build it but that's the kind of things I kind of get into and, and how would this work so as I mentioned I used 3D printing for all the windows the doors I've done, I've built stairs before out of styrene, they're kind of a pain. This is all 3D. Um, these up here are 3D. The support here, what's underneath the tiles here, is 3D printed. I've built those out of styrene before, but they're kind of a pain. When I got all done, I was actually looking around, what else can I do in 3D? Ah, they must have had some t chairs out there to look at the river after dinner. So I picked a chair and I found a, a plan online. I drew them up, had them printed, and I thought it looked a little small, but I drew them from scale plans. They've got to be right. Put them on the porch, tried to put a person in them, and he wouldn't fit. I had drawn up children's chairs. So I threw those away, got new plans, made sure they were for adults, and threw those all up and had those printed. So. That, that's the fun part. I, I love getting off of this stuff, but like I say, it's addictive, and pretty soon you want to do everything. And if you were to actually look inside, there's beds and dressers, also 3D printed. Lights come on and you can look through them and so forth. So, a fun project that turned out to be more prototype, way more prototype than my first effort. So this is Emory. This was a location of a limestone quarry. As you can see in the prototype picture, there were two of these buildings, and they were for the workers. If you think about it, this particular town was a long way from stores, anything. They would not hire a married guy. If you showed up with your wife, they would tell you to leave. Uh, I don't know how you would even show up, because you'd have to come in by railroad. But this was a place for the workers to sleep and eat. There were, like I say, there were two of them. I really didn't have room over here for the second one. I could have put it in. But that makes the scene about 20% longer. And what I really like to do is be able to have a train come through here and a caboose is a long way away before it gets into the next town. These are the only two or three structures that were here. The hotel lasted, the first one burned about 15, 20 years ago. Uh, I don't remember how it caught on fire, burned to the ground. So I can actually say now that I'm totally prototype that this one is gone. This one got burned last year in the Ferguson fire that was just west of Yosemite. However, a group of YV fans, um, we got together about 20 years ago, maybe, or 25 years ago. One of the guys on the chat list is a part owner of this 640 acres right here. And so there was no bridge to get in here. There was a cable way so you could get on a little cart and pull yourself across the river. And one of our members had some uh, rafts, so he took our sleeping gear and so forth. So we went over and spent the night there, 
climbed all the way up 2,000 feet to the top of the incline, out of the quarry, came back, and so forth. Uh, so I've actually slept in this building, which was kind of cool. And then, now I'm talking maybe 35 years ago, a couple got in touch with me, uh, asked if they can come over, and they, at the time, were living in this building. So they came into the layout room, looked around, and they saw the building they were living in, which is kind of cool. Um, so that was pretty simple to build. This I didn't have any information on. This is a 275-ton bunker. This limestone would come be, uh, brought down, dropped into this holding bin, and then loaded into a railroad uh, rock cars. What I did is I had a photo looking across the river straight on with one of these rock cars in the picture. And I knew how long the rock car was, so I used that to, to draw up the plans. Well, like many other things, uh, it's a little off, but it's not that far. When we got into Emory, I'd already built this, and I found the footings were still there. So I measured between the footings, and I'm about 10% too small, I think. Um, but I'm not going to build another one. What was also kind of fun is I climbed up on the hillside where the sign had been, and when this place went out of operation, somebody went up there with a chainsaw and sawed the posts that were holding up the sign. So I was able to measure the distance between the two outside posts supporting the sign. With that information, I was able to figure out how tall the sign was. And from that, I was able to make up the entire sign in Photoshop print it, cut it out, and mount it on the hillside. Okay, this is bridge 64A. This is one of half a dozen wood trestles on the layout. Uh, this one's interesting because it has concrete footings and some of them are stepped. The prototype was 160 feet long, mine is 80 feet long, so it's half, half length. One thing that I did that I just didn't know at the time is I stained the wood on these. Uh, it's not that far off. When I first started modeling the YV, I went down to Merced, and uh, just outside Merced, there was a wood trestle still in existence. The ties were gone, the rails were gone, but I was able to measure it, photograph it, and so the color is, is pretty close. Uh, it depends on when the bridge was built and so forth, but I'm not too far off on that. And I was able to measure the size of all the, the timber um, pieces in the bridge, and they were consistent everywhere. You know, all the stringers were the same size, all the posts were the same size. So, um, and I knew the span is 16 feet, and so that's consistent. Okay, this is another situation where things changed because I got more information, but it did not result in rebuilding a structure. What happened is Jim Blaw, who's model right here and lives around the corner, uh, maybe 35 years ago, I met him and we take a little tour and this is now a paved road and we walk down here and there was a little concrete slab right here with a, a casting on top of it. And I asked him what it was and here's a really poor photo, this is back before digital, uh, that shows it barely. And he said, oh, that was for a stiff-legged crane. And I thought, oh, that would be cool to model and people will say, what is it? Because all I modeled was what I saw, the concrete and the bearing. Then years later, I got this photo, and it was taken in 1939, and you can see the stiff legged Derrick is there. Now typically, these were used all over the place. Uh, on the YV, there was one at Snelling to unload things. You would have an upright, you'd have an arm out here, and you'd have one uh, piece of uh, timber going back here and one here, and that would keep it from falling over when you swung it this way. But there's not room for this, and this hillside is prototype. It's right there. So what I did is I put one leg out here and a wood leg out here and tied them off, built the crane, and again, thought it looked good and wrote a story for the Gazette, got it published. Then I got this photo taken from across the river, and you can see guy wires. Did not have the wood parts that I... Had. So I took those out and guy wired it. So now it actually moves because these wires are going down through a hole and there's a little weight down there. So if anybody bumps it by accident, they're not going to hurt it. 
this is the rest of the structures at incline around the corner from where we were before. Uh, there's an outhouse here, which I'm not positive it was there. Jim Law lived here until he passed away about 1990. I've been inside this building many times, so I went back up and I measured it. Uh, I didn't see any pipes that would indicate that they had indoor plumbing. I'm sure they did. But I did see this little pathway, and that's why I felt, at least in 39, there was an outhouse down here. This outhouse was pretty simple as you can get. It's a solid piece of wood, cut to the right dimensions for the sides, an angle cut on the top, cut it to the right length, and covered with paper, paper that has a wood pattern on it. Then we have the station here. I built one of these before for a previous layout. Again, my workmanship at those days was still getting better. Uh, so I think I built that building around 1975 or so. Uh, so it also looks like it's the wrong proportions, more photos, and so this I think is correct. They also had a little uh, freight house here. That shows up in a photo. And then you can barely see the top of this building. And Jim Law, who I visited many times when he lived here, told me this was the station agent's house. And there's one photo from here, and you can see kind of that it's cantilevered. So this is all correct as far as where the river was. So I built this, this is cantilevered over the river. And after I built it, then I asked Jim Law, was the station agent's house cantilevered over the river? And he says, no, I don't think so. And I thought, oh, I don't have any room to do it right if, that's, if it's wrong. Then he said, no, I think you're right. I don't know which way it really was. If he was being sympathetic to me and distorting the truth or what. Um, but that's how I have it. I do know that it had indoor plumbing because I asked Jim about it. Uh, it was built in 1923. And so I show plumbing on the outside. This would be typical of plumbing that was added after the building was built. Not sure about the swamp cooler, but we had these when I was growing up. I grew up in Bakersfield. It was very hot during the summer. And so this is built out of styrene with a metal casting or pressing or whatever that represents diesel grills, some F unit diesel grills or something. I don't know what it was for, but I took those and that makes the grills on the side. You always had water in these things. And so there's a drain pipe because it would pump water from a little holding tank here up to the top and then the water go through all the cooling coils or the, the mats behind them and or pads. And that's why you made it cool inside the house. Now we're at El Pertel, the end of the line. Uh, there's a number of structures here. I'm just gonna point out a few things. This one is also styrene. Uh, what I did is I built the entire building out of styrene and then added all of the uh, corrugated. And this is Campbell's corrugated. Uh, the building itself was called the Government Warehouse. Remember that the railroad was built in 1907, and at that time, people traveled by stagecoach. Uh, there were some cars. The park district did not allow automobiles in the park until 1913. So everybody that went to the park from here uh, up until 1913 went in by stagecoach. The park was governed by the military, cavalry, so there are a lot of horses in the park that needed um, hay. And so the, the railroad actually tried to negotiate with the National Park Service to cut rates for various things uh, in return for getting their hay at a cheaper price because it's brought in by, by train. So that's where the name came from. I have no photos of this side, but it is on a hillside. I know where it was. I have photos of the other three sides. Knowing what it was, I think what they did is they would bring a car in, unload it because this is the right height, store it as needed, and then when they're going to sh ship it up to the park, they'd be in a wagon with a horse and then lower it down into the wagon. So no one is picking up these bales of hay, which are heavy. You're lowering them down, taking advantage of the hillside. This building is still there. Uh, it is now owned by the Park Service. 
it was their personnel office. I think now it's uh, something else. I've been inside of it, measured it up, so it's all accurate and so forth. Moving on, we have these three buildings. They were workers' cottages. They were built by the railroad. And if you were paying attention, you'll notice that the colors are reversed. These are gray with white trim. The stations were white with gray trim. I know the people that lived in all three of these in 1939. I've been inside this one. Most of these have been really highly modified with second story additions and side additions and all kinds of stuff. One of the problems that people have that live there now is they own the house, but not the property underneath it. The Park Service owns this entire area. And so if you want to make a room addition, you can't get a loan because you don't own the property. The hotel was about in this location. I had three photos, and what I did this time, I didn't look at the person, I looked at the stair height, because I could see how many stairs it was up, and um, worked from there. And that was one that the black and white pictures, I wasn't sure what the color was. So I've mentioned Jim Law before. Uh, he actually came to this area with his parents, in 1907, when he was six years old and lived his entire life either here or down the river at Incline. And so fortunately on this one, I was up there, I was gonna ask him the colors before I painted the building. And I really wanted it to be something besides white, gray, or red. And so I was up there and I asked Jim, I said, Jim, do you remember the hotel? Oh yeah. Well, I was looking at these pictures, and I think it was green with yellow trim. And he says, yeah, that, that, that sounds right. And then his daughter, who lived with him in her entire life, and she was probably in her 70s at that time, said, no, Dad, I think it was red with white trim. <sighs> so that's what I painted it. Last two buildings we're going to talk about are the station at El Portel and the train shed. Both of them are all styrene. I gave a lot of thought on this building to using wood because all of this architectural detail up in here was wood. It was trim, uh, trimmed pieces of branches and so forth. And so it made sense, but I don't like working with wood because it takes too long for the, the glue to dry. Styrene, as I've shown in that styrene video, uh, dries in three or four seconds. So, and I also thought about making individual panels and casting them out of resin, but that takes a long time too. Um, I think I've mentioned before I'm very impatient. I, I don't, I do everything I want and go to the, the fullest degree that I can, but I don't like to do things that take longer than they should. If I've got a, an idea that makes things go faster, I will do it uh, if it doesn't compromise the outcome. So this one also has full interior detailing. Jim Law, the guy I've been talking about, had been in the building and he told me what was in these you know, details. There was a post office right here, which I modeled. There was a picture on the wall of a, another railroad and um, I couldn't find a picture of it in those days. And so I, I substituted another picture, uh, but it was a Colorado railroad and the railroad would send out uh, prints maybe this big, I guess, and um, the railroad put it, mounted it and put it inside the, the waiting room. Uh, this is all baggage. There was a lot of baggage that came into this station because everything that was getting shipped into the park, or most of it, would come by rail and then taken by truck into the park. Now, they could have driven that entire distance, but all the roads at that time, and it, it, even into 39, were all dirt. You know, if they, you had a map, but I've got a AAA map from the mid-20s, and it shows the paved roads, which was the main highway up going through the middle of California, and everything else was dirt. So it was a long, slow, dusty drive in a truck where you could ship it, unload it here, come in a truck, pick it up, and take it into the park. And we're talking all the food. Uh, the briefers came in here because there were stuff that had to be um, cold storage, and they were taken into the park. There's movies showing reefers being unloaded. The train shed uh, should have been longer. Well, it, 
I didn't have room to make as long as I wanted, but it gives you a pretty good idea of how long it was. It was added in the uh, 20s. Again, all styrene. Um, it's not actually anchored down because I need a way to, if I have a car that derails in there, I need to have a, be able to take it completely off. Um, but as I, I didn't mention, it had all the interior detailing, and so I had a piece of the roof that was not there, and what I had planned to do was to, I had a piece that fit into the hole, and I was gonna put uh, roofing material on it, but I just never got around to it. And then when I would take photos here for magazine articles, you'd see this big gap. And so visitors would say, oh, are they re-roofing the building? No. And so like the other ones, I finally just said, that's it. And I glued the thing in place and, and roofed the rest of it. So that wraps up this episode. What I'd like you to think about is you saw a lot of buildings. There's a lot of buildings on this layout, but they were built over a very long time. This layout was started 30 years ago, uh, or 40 years ago. Uh, and my skills have improved tremendously since I began. Remember the building, I showed you the pictures of my first hotel at Bagby, that I was not sure I even wanted to share that, because that was such an embarrassingly bad model. But uh, as I mentioned, I, I noticed it one day and I thought, I've got to do better. And the replacement was a lot of fun. You might have heard the, the energy in talking about the replacement hotel that I got into 3D printing and doing all this kinds of stuff and so forth. So that's a lot of the reward I have or I get from the hobby. What I encourage people to do is if you're modeling a prototype or even a prototype place, it helps to pay attention to what you should be modeling. You might have noticed that there were only one brick building on the entire layout. That's because in California we did not use bricks because they fall down in earthquakes. Uh, I couldn't model Maine because I don't know what the buildings there would look like. So if you're modeling the Midwest, find photos or visit it. Take pictures of buildings that were still there or are still there that are old, and that will give you some ideas of what the buildings would look like. They don't have to be exact models. You don't have to go out and measure them if you don't want to, but you can build representations of them. And as you do that, your skills will get better. Not only will your, the end result be better, the model will be better, but you'll get faster. You won't spend so much time redoing something or thinking, how can I do this? You'll just get in and do it. And that's where the reward comes from. I get enormous reward from building models, and I always have. People can't understand why I don't run trains in my layout. That's not my thing. I build things. And so just keep that in mind, that if you're just getting started, you can achieve the same thing. I'm old, and I was doing this for a long, long, long time. Uh, some of the very first models, when I first got back into the model hobby, when I was 20 years old, were atrocious. Uh, I threw them all away. Um, and so it does take time and experience, but you just got to get out and do it. <laughs>